Alright, this is Billy Goat with Doomed and Stoned, and today I am interviewing Mike Scheidt. Uh, did I say your name correctly? You did, absolutely. It sounds exactly like the expletive in the UK. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's punk nice. rock. Yeah. <laughs> right on. And we are eating at a, a little bar in Eugene, Oregon called Taylor's, which is a, kind of a staple of the University of Oregon area for, gosh, a long time. Um, we're waiting on... Uh, waiting on uh, salad and whatever else and uh, so thanks for taking some time to meet with me today and and answer a few questions from myself and from our listeners um, so uh, first question is you seem to have a really strong connection with the local community um, are you from the Eugene area yeah I am I grew up in uh, Springfield Oregon and actually technically outside of Springfield in the Mohawk Valley. So, um, yeah, I've always been here and traveled a lot. And there's, I mean, there's lots of great places in the world. And, and there's definitely places I've visited where I felt like, yeah, I could live here. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, traveling and then coming home, I mean, the Northwest is, I just have really strong roots in the Northwest from just, the air to the scenery to the vibe it's just it's home you've obviously had a chance to be a lot of other places so yeah fair that amount, says a lot. you know a fair amount um you know there's places i haven't been that i'd like to go but mm -hmm. yeah um i definitely do have strong roots here what's uh well here's our food. That's okay so we were talking about your connections to the eugene springfield community you were raised in this area i see you around shows now and then you seem to really support the local scene uh, um yeah I, not as much as i would like mm -hmm. um you know partially because i travel so much uh partially because i have you know three kids and um you know partially social anxiety partially mm -hmm. i spend a lot of time in my in a year in clubs mm -hmm. and uh, when i get home i get kind of hermetic um, yeah. sometimes but i you know i don't go to all the shows that i'd like to but I, I i have a lot of friends here and a lot of artists you know people that are working hard on their art and uh, yeah i definitely want to be always want to be supportive of that you know i mean we're we're all the same yeah Far yeah. as that goes, we're all doing our best and expressing ourselves, and that's worthy of support. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but I've always sensed that you just have a real emotional connection to Eugene and Springfield, and just the the whole area and the people and the the art and the music. And well, it's my home, you know. I mean, I mean, I think anyone that plays in bands here regularly could easily say that they don't see me often at shows, mm -hmm. um, and that is probably equally as true. But uh, I think I just get, um, you know, like I said, you know, it's a combination of just traveling a lot and not being here always for mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. family responsibilities when I'm here, um, social anxiety too. It's a combination of things, you know. It's, you know, we're all, you know, we we all come to art for various reasons, and um, and I think for a lot of us, it's therapy. Yeah, you know? I find that very very true. Um, when I'm playing piano, it's like a total release for me. But one thing I haven't been able to transcend that you have is performing in public. So it seems um, a little bit of a paradox to deal with social anxiety. I mean, I freeze up, I yeah. tense up. Um, I feel like this burning heat, like everyone's eyes are on me, and then I, I flop, right? Mm -hmm. You overcome that. Uh, how do you... You know, as also somebody who's got a lot of social anxiety, what is it that you have? Uh, how do I guess how how do you get up there on the stage and and just uh, give such excellent performances that people are not? Uh, well, I don't know. Um, I think it's like anything. The more that you do it, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. um, I also feel like. I don't know how it is for other musicians. Um, the people in bands that I resonate with. Uh, oh, is 
Good. No, no. That, would, that would be fantastic. Uh, Thank you. Um, okay, I'm in our diet, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, to start that over, um, that one part I was about to say, uh, the, the bands and my friends in the music community that I resonate with the most are those that see live shows as a uh, community event. Mm -hmm. And that the event itself isn't just the fact that they're on stage. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the event is the environment that gets created when however many people show up, whether that's 20 people, whether that's 200, whether that's 2,000, mm -hmm. whether that's 20,000, that there's an environment that the band is a part of. Right. And so then that connection is what is key. Um, I think... You know, I mean, it's it's kind of a cliche to to talk about bands that you know are maybe high on themselves and that they feel that they are the event. Mm -hmm. Though I see that less and less all the time, and maybe it's the circle mm -hmm. of musicians that I regularly play in. Um, certainly, we played with bands, very big bands, very small bands, even that don't watch other bands that sit out in their van or out there in their tour bus until it's time for them to play or they sit backstage and and uh i'm just i can only speak for myself i'm just not that guy mm -hmm. you know and uh i don't mean that too judgmentally either there's there i think when people do this stuff every day and they do it year in year out you start to occasionally get to that point where you you feel like you just need to have some separation yeah. um i haven't reached that yet um, I feel. I just feel like I want to be in the crowd. I want to watch bands. Mm -hmm. um, I want to meet other people. I want to talk about music. It's what got me there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that hasn't changed. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of younger listeners who are. I mean, it's it's always fun to see the comments when I post a a job track my favorite is burning the altar of course there's this awesome video i don't know who made it i think it was a fan that made uh, a video on youtube uh around the making of one of the atomic bombs and oh, the cool. detonation in the pacific have you seen that uh, uh, really i'm gonna totally I've seen the twin peaks one I, yeah I, I, i'm gonna I totally link it it's so like haunting that it fits the music and the character so well even though it may not even be what was intended through the lyrics right um but i posted that the other day and you know someone said wow why have i never heard this band before this is awesome and so forth so for that listener for the new new person uh, what is job what is it about uh, what does it mean what is it to you and what why did you start the band well there's the fan piece which is being a music fan, um, being a heavy metal, punk fan, but also just being a fan of music, period. Mm -hmm. So as a musician, that's part of what drives you, obviously, is what you what got you there in the first place, what made you want to express yourself in that way. Um, uh, having definite then genre connections, so whether that be Cathedral or Burning Witch or Neurosis or Sleep or... Mm -hmm. You know, the, the list goes on and on, you know, the obsessed. Yeah. Um, the bands that got me started into the genre, there's that piece. Uh, then the piece that is the, that has kept me doing it, I think, for a long time is the personal piece. And the personal piece of it being a combination of, of spirituality, mm -hmm. therapy, um, uh, a constant need to to connect mm -hmm. and be connected with the community um, of listeners and, and fans that are we're exactly identical to mm -hmm. um, so uh, and then there's that piece of it and all of those together is why 15 years later we're still a band yeah 
a community piece, I think, is something that people are really starving for. That's that's what motivated me to, long before I attended a, a metal show, to reach out on Facebook and try to find a, a metal community, and then eventually stumbling upon the the Doomers and the Stoners and whatever they call themselves. Um, so I can. I think this is the first I've really heard. I, you know, every every band has a fan base, and there's a real sense of community around that. But to start a band with the intention of building community is something well, very. Fifteen years ago, in in Eugene, Oregon, I'm talking like 1992, 93, 94. Right. Um, I'm trying to remember when the first Electric Wizard came out, but it was. It was in the mid '90s. Mid '90s, yeah. yeah. And um, I, I was the only guy I knew around here mm -hmm. that knew what that was. And you know, doom and stoner music wasn't even called that. No. You know, it was called doom metal. Yeah. You know, I mean, I heard that term. Stoner music was like something that came later. Stoner mm -hmm. rock, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so part of being so passionate about it I, I felt this desperate kind of need to connect with somebody else mm -hmm. who could be like come my fanatics right you yeah know, right and that wasn't in my hometown um, as much back then I mean there's a couple of people but not a lot and so um, even doing the demo where I couldn't find anybody around here that would understand or be into it and so I just had a buddy from high school come in who was a very good metal drummer and I just gave him tons of CDs and just kind of kept telling him that ah, you sped that up it's sped it up it's got to be slow it's got to be slower it's got to be slower <laughs> than that and it just wasn't where people were playing from at that point mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, at least around you know at least in my experience around here and so um so now, you know, all these years later, the community is vast and growing, and, and I still think there's people that go on and on about, you know, people jumping on a bandwagon and on a trend, and mm -hmm. oh, now I don't ever want to hear the word doom again, etc. And and I kind of feel I've always been of the mind that of just an inclusive mind, to where just speaking for myself, it's like, yeah, I know it's amazing. Why wouldn't someone else think it's amazing? Why wouldn't five other people think it's amazing? Why wouldn't a hundred people, a thousand people, a hundred thousand people think this is amazing? Mm -hmm. Because it is amazing, and I know it. Yeah. And so, for it to grow and grow and grow, I don't care if they have their hat on sideways or front or, mm -hmm. or you know, what their clothes they're wearing. If they're there because they're blown away, then they're there for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And if that grew from a hundred thousand people, from a thousand people, it doesn't make it any less special. Um, that kind of keep it small just for myself crowd, I don't relate to. Mm -hmm. And I don't also don't relate to the commercialism side of it either, where somebody is trying to manipulate a group of people to like them mm -hmm. based on jumping on a style. I, but I think that the truth in the music weeds that out. I think we can tell mm -hmm. who's true and legit and playing it from their heart because they have no other choice mm -hmm. for that particular medium versus someone who's like, wow, this looks like a cool thing. I want to get in on it, um, which I think happens a lot less than, than mm -hmm. folks lead on. Yeah. You know, people just want to have this cool club, and, and I tend to think that the cool club is the cool club period, whether there's 10 members or 100,000. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah. I like that philosophy. Um, so, by the way, did you go to Springfield High? Thurston. Thurston. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, my stepkids went to Springfield. Yeah. Um, so, is it a rumor or is it official that you're working on a new album? Oh, it's w very official. Um, we're going to record in like three weeks. Okay. Yeah. It's nerve wracking. Where are you recording? Uh, local. Uh, Gung Ho Studio. Oh, cool. Uh, Gung Ho Mixed. The Unreal Never Lived and The Illusion of Motion. Mm -hmm. Dude, his name is Billy Barnett, so he mixed both of those records. He also mastered them. And then he also mastered 
the great cessation and ama but he didn't mix those records okay so we've been working with billy barnett since 2005 i want to say wow um, and maybe maybe earlier than that maybe 2004 even and the studio that we've always recorded at locally was called dogwood recording and every single recording Yob has done, aside from a live recording, has been done at that studio with mm -hmm. Jeff Olson. And he went, he decided he didn't want to do it anymore for various reasons about mm -hmm. a year and a half ago. And uh, we've been at a loss of like, what are we going to do? And we tossed around a lot of different able studios, able engineers, able producers. Uh, maybe traveling to Seattle, maybe traveling to California, maybe going to Portland. We even talked about, you know, uh, going to Chicago. And then we kind of said, wait a minute, you know, there's this studio in town that is fabulous that's always been out of our budget because, you know, Gung Ho Studio is a. Um, I mean, Billy Barnett's been doing this for a long time, mm -hmm. and he's a mega pro. And he's, he's done um, platinum records. You know, so he's no joke. And we just kind of decided, wait a minute, there's this guy that, that is in town here that's been involved in four of our records. Mm -hmm. um, there's no reinventing the wheel there. We don't have to explain anything. Yeah. And it's a drive, for me, it's a drive across town. And, you know, being that I travel for almost everything, whether it be you know, traveling to Portland every week for band practice, for me to record a record and just drive literally across town to do tracking, vocals, um, it's really great. <clears throat> but on top of that, it's a world-class studio. So the stars aligned, low stress. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's more, it's more expensive than what we're used to, but the quality there is total. And, That's awesome. And so... Um, we're pretty confident that it's going to be great. Very cool. Um, what can you tell us about the theme or the spirit of the new album? Um, you know, uh, stylistically, uh, lyrically. I mean, it's it's. There's nothing that's a departure from what we've done. Mm -hmm. Though uh, I think the pacing of this record is definitely different than any record we've done in a while. Where you know, the last three or four records start out with something that's pretty throttling mm -hmm. and then kind of goes through its meandering passages where like, um, like the Catharsis record started out with a slower song mm -hmm. and then got crazier. And so this record is kind of more like that. Okay. Um, where it's going to start out with a bludgeoner <clears throat> that's definitely straight up us but in the slower fashion mm -hmm. um, though it still to me anyway feels like first song of the record vibe um, you know I can look at a group of songs and kind of figure out all right what's the introduction to the record what what's the peaks and valleys and pick songs accordingly mm -hmm. um, the second song picks up the pace quite a bit um, and we will do stuff that on the record that people who know us will instantly recognize as us. Um, there are things on the record that definitely are taking steps in different directions too. Um, so it's definitely us, same, but different. Very cool. Well, I think we're just going to be happy to have more Yob. I mean, Lumbar was like a an oasis in the desert. Um, for a lot of us, and I am kind of interested in, in that, even though this isn't an interview about Lumbar per se, um, I've done a lot of um, corresponding with Aaron Edge, just informally over Facebook, yeah. and kind of learn more about things, and um, you know, you guys put together such a, a brilliant record, and it was just, it's just kind of one of those, uh, I don't know if we could Put it in artistic terms like a, a painting that you just get inspired by and, and you make it and it's the Mona Lisa or whatever and that's how a lot of a lot of us feel about um, 
the first and last days of unwelcome. Well, Aaron, Aaron hit that out of the park. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And and I think he, I mean, his story is kind of fairly well documented. And mm -hmm. um, I have endless respect for him and his strength and mm -hmm. and uh, and what he. I mean, I've always had that respect for him in general as an artist. I mean, I've known him for a long time, though battling the disease and his ups and downs with it uh, that um, that all went into that record and, and initially I think he would have liked to have had that be much more collaborative than it ended up being mm -hmm. um, I think he wanted he wanted to do it primarily in garage band and he wanted me to to write the lyrics and mm -hmm. and uh, and I kept kind of throwing that stuff back to him saying look if you really can't play anymore this is part of your legacy and we need right. to find a better vehicle for this as a studio and mm -hmm. we called Tad and and that became a possibility and Tad and myself and Aaron all have old roots so yeah. it was not difficult to make that happen um, Aaron you know like I said wanted me to write the lyrics and mm -hmm. I kind of told him it's like ah, I can do my normal thing but if you write about where you're coming from right now that's going to be a lot heavier, yeah. You know, and that's where this music came from to begin with is from you. So, write about your experience, and then of course, you know, not not, not of course, but rather it became obvious that that was the way to go. That right. it did make for a much heavier record, the lyrically, and then I helped him structure some of those lyrics for sure, and you know, added my singing to it and whatnot, but. I mean, at the end of the day, that's an Aaron Edge yeah. thing. Yeah. It's an Aaron Edge record. Yeah. Um, I don't remember in any of the interviews I read, and I didn't read all of them, but um, the the tie-in with the, was it Once Upon a Time in the Old West? Mm -hmm. What what was that about? Well, Aaron would be more best better, better suited. Suit. Okay. Yeah, um, though he chose all of those samples yeah, and yeah. Uh, various things deliberately for sure they definitely add a, yeah you know that's part of what makes that record great is, yeah is the non-music elements right the, the the soundscapes and the things that he yeah. came up with that just sometimes was maybe from a movie yeah other times it was just him walking around with the iphone saying oh i like the sound of that yeah that's really cool and then you tweak it yeah um with your your current group uh and yob um do you guys contribute specific things to the songwriting process um, pretty much since day one to present um, I write mm -hmm. everything okay and and I have definite ideas around what drums do what bass lines do mm -hmm. in my writing and so and it's not like a control freak thing it's rather I just I, I think in um, I think in, in pictures, not in, in individual mm -hmm. colors. And so the individual colors contribute to the picture, but I see the whole picture when I'm writing a song. And typically what I'll do is I'll come to the band with not a riff, but an, an entire song or an entire set of arrangements and say, look, this is what I'm thinking for drums. This is what I'm thinking for bass. Let's use that as a springboard. And then from there, things get tweaked, bass lines get written, drum things get tweaked, whatever it is. Um, but I've always kind of approached the band and this songwriting as, um, as I bring pretty complete ideas um, that really at the end of the day, um, I bring lots of complete ideas that don't make the cut. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is, is that if the three of us were the truth sensor, and if we're not all way into whatever we're playing, then it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. If one person isn't feeling it, it doesn't work. And it doesn't matter if I thought it was the greatest idea in the world. If we're not translating that into something that, that makes us forget that we're in a rehearsal space, then it's not, it's not good enough. Cool. <clears throat> um, well, I was kind of curious, I don't want to get too off 
in these rabbit trails uh, with your other bands, but um, I'm really curious. I was looking at the metal encyclopedia and it had you listed um, with Geistus and Vol. Is that the correct way to pronounce mm -hmm. those? Yeah. Um, from, you know, 2008, 2009, whatever, to present. Are you still active with those bands in some sense? or at Still least... active with Vol. Uh -huh. um, Geistus was something that I did as like a side project, uh, kind of black metal-ish influence uh -huh. thing. Um, but it's also influenced by, you know, like black metal, like the kind of weird side of black metal, like, you know, Beherit, yeah. Vaughn, Black Witchery, um, things like that. And, uh, um, and I did one, two sets of recordings one that was me all by myself doing every single you know drums guitar bass um one where there was a drum machine and a buddy helped me kind of put that together um but you know i'd like to do something more with it eventually we did one show uh, with uh, sean shock came out and played drums on it very cool and uh um so that was one and one time only so far scenario and but Vol is definitely active. Uh, we okay. did the record last year, and, yep. and I'm sure we'll do another record. And I think we might be playing a show or two this year. I'm not sure. But it's. Yeah. Thanks. Um, but you know, all of the members of Vol have other bands that are fairly active, and so it was kind of our opportunity to play together. And we're all old friends from having played together in many bands. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yob has played with what I mentioned. Aesop or Sigrid or uh, uh, John Cobbett, Yob has played with their other bands, Amber Asylum, Ludicra, Agalock, um, so uh, Hammer's Misfortune, so we're, we're all pretty connected from like over a decade ago. Okay, very cool. And then just toward the tail end of 2013, you went on a solo tour. Yeah. Um, did you write new material for that? Or was that kind of just no? There's no there's no Yob unplugged. Yeah, um, it's pretty much. I mean, I think it's from the 2012 album primarily. Well, and covers, and then I, I did have new material, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, it's acoustic yep. Yep. based, and it's not. Um, yeah, I mean, I say that, but like my record is my solo record, six songs in like 40 minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's. It's not like it's 10 or 12 acoustic songs sure. and so there's similarities to Yob I guess in yeah. ways but I, mean, I grew up in the kind of the golden era of 60s and yeah. 70s folk and that's more of where I come from much to some people's chagrin you know it's over dramatic and cheesy and you know, <laughs> when I listen to Jim Croce and, and uh, Cat Stevens and Crosby Stills and Nash and that's that's what I hear yeah so yeah so it sounds like that's going to be something you're going to continue to come back to time and time again. It's I think so. I go in and out. You know, you go back to like when we were talking about nervousness around playing live music. If there's one thing that really makes me nervous, it's playing solo. Yeah. More than anything else that I do. And so sometimes I go in and out of whether I'm going to keep doing it. But yet, so far, I keep doing it. So I just booked another show. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. Right on. Um, so can we transition now to the questions from the Doomed and Stone listeners? Yep. Is this a good time or do you want to take a break? No, 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 let's do it. All right, cool. Um, so <clears throat> Jared Smith, he's a guitarist for a band named Cadman out of Great Falls, Montana. He asks, does living in the Pacific Northwest environment of Eugene, Oregon have any influence on the way you write your music? Does it impact how your music ends up sounding? Oh, I'm sure that it does in, in ways that are not necessarily a thought process. It's just mm -hmm. your environment and what you're surrounded by. Um, uh, and then certainly, you know, in Eugene, Oregon, as far as me being a person that had like at one period of time kind of had a desire to study, you know, meditation or study, you know, different kind of ideas around spirituality, different faiths, whatever. I mean, Eugene is a... It's an old hippie town, mm -hmm. so there's no shortage of being able to do that. And there's no doubt that some of that's played out in my music, um, for sure. Uh, and 
you know, there's there's probably just as, as many ways that I can't vocalize at the moment that play into it as ones that I can. Um, yeah, environment absolutely has a has a, a part in what you're creating. So yeah, I'm sure the Northwest does, and the Northwest has a very healthy music community too, mm -hmm. and and there are threads that are uniquely Pacific Northwest um, as far as things that are saying about and the way that the Northwest bands influence each other versus like mm -hmm. the DC scene and the way they influence each other and there's a there can be different bands but it's somehow a common thread I think that exists here check and make sure this is still going strong yep um, so Adam from the band uh, Bedroom Rehab Corporation in New London, Connecticut says, uh, Mike for sure has been one of the best, most varied and distinct voices in Doom. Was this a concentrated effort to bring as many vocal styles to the table or is it more what came out as you were creating the songs? Well, when we first did the demo, it was all clean singing mm -hmm. and though you know, when I first started writing those songs in like 95 or 96, I was already, had been listening to black metal, death metal, um, hardcore punk, grindcore, everything. So all the, all the styles that I do now were not like new ideas. Um, I just had kind of compartmentalized that I was going to do a Doom thing and it was going to be clean vocals. Um, that next record, I started definitely adding more kinds of vocals to it. And then as time has gone on, I just kind of feel like that there are certain riffs that a clean voice isn't the best choice. You know, and there are certain riffs. And so, uh, whether it be... And then from there, yeah, I mean, there's there's been lots of great vocalists that have paved the way as far as having multi-dimensional vocals, you know, whether it be Ed 59 from from uh, uh, Witch or uh, you know, one of my favorites, uh, uh, Jason Madonka from uh, Acrocock. A lot of different singing voices for one person. And then it becomes, it's just like no different than your guitar or your instrument where you're not playing in just one scale or one key or, you know, just pentatonic scales. I mean, you know, there's some people that do that and that's okay. But what gets really interesting to me is when you know, there's a lot of color and a lot of variation. You know, as long as it's inspired and on point, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, but yeah, I want the voice to be an instrument. I don't want it to be the first song and, okay, now you know what you're in for. Um, I want there to be surprises. I want right. there to have things that are interesting. Like, oh, you know, that's an interesting way of approaching that riff. And, uh, and that's important to me. That keeps me interested as yeah. well. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Liam from Seattle. Hendrix once said, I don't play guitar, I play amplifier. I'd ask Mike to comment on that with his own playing and recording philosophy. Well... Tone is a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't like what you're hearing, it's hard to get, it's hard to lose yourself. You know, if you're playing through gear that you do not like the sound of, I mean, you know, there's there's lots of different ideas around tone and, and people that are like, yeah, who cares about my gear, listen to my riffs, and, and I get all of it, and it's all good. Uh, I do feel like, for me, I'm not... I'm not playing guitars or amps, I'm kind of playing, I'm kind of just delving into myself. And then those are the vehicles for that. And so, um, yeah, you know, there's, I found uh, guitars now that I feel really comfortable with that I don't have to think about when I'm playing. You know, I'm just playing. You know, I'm not struggling with the guitar. Um, amplifiers, pedals, same thing. I want to play, I want to, I want my gear to be able to translate the sound in my head to the best of my ability. Um, but uh, I used to think a lot more about gear than I do now. Mm -hmm. uh, these days I'm, I'm more worried about 
the quality of stuff that's happening. Yeah. And then, you know, as far as which canvas I'm using, mm. um, little less concerned about that. Okay. Um, actually, the next question is about gear, if you don't mind. Um, Michael from the band Snow White out of Longview, Washington says, give us your gear rundown. Do you mind maybe yeah. give us a synopsis? Right now I'm using a Brent Monson Nomads, 25-inch uh, scale. They're loaded with uh, lace nitrohemis. Um, my strings I use are the D'Addario 14 to 68 baritone strings and an A standard tuning. Uh, I use uh, Mammoth cabinets. And they're both two cabinets made custom for me by Tom uh, Mutrino. And uh, sorry if I'm butchering your name there, Tom. And uh, it's basically loaded with Eminence uh, 120 watt Man of War speakers. So each cab's at 480 watts. Right now I'm trying to figure out heads because occasionally the tone in my head changes. And then I have to come up with new amplification to match the new tone. Uh, right now I have an Ampeg V4. Um, loaded with uh, 6550s. I've been borrowing a uh, Sour Sound uh, 75 watt KT88 amplifier that he's made, non master volume amplifier. I don't like gain and amps for my what I do. Uh, my pedal board is uh, Black Arts Toneworks Quantum Mystic Overdrive that I designed with them, Pigtronics uh, Germanium Compressor. Uh, into a Black Arts Toneworks uh, Ferro Fuzz, into a um, Whirlwind Rochester Orange Box, which is a their version of a Phase 90 by MXR, designed by and assisted by the guy who invented MXR. So it's a le super legit pedal into a piece of shit um, Digitech. Uh, DFX9 uh, delay uh, voted by Guitar Player Magazine is one of the most horrible stomp boxes in history, but I've been using it for over a decade and I just works for you. Yeah. It's you know I've had the opportunity to have a lot of different delays and for whatever reason I keep returning to that one. Yeah. Um, into a uh, uh, a morally bad horsey that Steve Vai pedal. I just love that that uh, wah pedal. I can use it when I want, and instead of it being a button where you turn on and off, it just, it's a, um, you just step on it and it's instantly on and it has a spring. So when you're done, you walk away and it just comes right off. Nice. And so that's uh, what I've been using. And uh, I used to tour with a lot more gear, and now we tour a lot more with sound men. And I think seeing Neurosis a number of times mm -hmm. with half stacks, level level a show, level a sound system, I started to kind of realize, ah, you know, maybe I don't need three full stacks, you know, maybe yeah. we just need a really good tone and a really good sound man. Mm. And so, and then often, it sounds better. Yeah. It actually is a better sound out in the crowd, and so I think that was a, a big shift for us. So do you have a, a sound guy that you kind of take with you now? We do now, yes. It's awesome. A guy named, uh, um, I call him Ben Victory because he's from the band Hot Victory. Okay. But, yeah. Very cool. Um, so Angela, who's a freelance journalist in Houston for the German magazine Doom Metal Front. Okay. Um, she simply asked what CD is in your car stereo right now <laughs> and I know traveling to Portland you probably listen to quite a few but yeah 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 maybe you can give us a sense right now when I when I walked out of here uh, Morbid Angel uh, Blessed Are the Sick was in my cool. uh, in my CD player nice yeah nice um, and then um, one of our new DJs from Poland that I'm bringing on board to Doomed and Stone wanted to know five of your must-hear albums from 2013 or just overall and you don't have to get five I suppose but yeah yeah seem no, like a nice, nice round number new wolf serpent mm-hmm I think it's a must listen I 
haven't been spending as much time with new music stuff, yeah. um, as, I, as I, I'd, I'd like to. Um, new Sea of Bones. Mm -hmm. Fantastic new metal. Sea of Bones from Connecticut. New Uzula. Yeah. Tales of Fire and Death. That's a good one. Uh, that, this came out last year, but that new Neurosis is stuck with me. Uh, yeah. In a big way. Yeah. Um, or that new Portal, too. Vex mm -hmm. Void. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you. A um, couple more. So, Jazz Murray from the UK band Violation, or I'm sorry, Volition, um, says, How do you compare your own music towards that of your peers and influences? Oh, man. I just. I love listening to the music from my peers and influence and agonize when I listen to ours. <laughs> Um, I'm, uh, I think as an artist, I create and do as good as I can because I have to, but the end result when all said and done, I just never hear in any kind of objective way. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I'm kind of, I've become okay with that. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't have to. You know, each one of us as an artist is just doing our very best. And I think the ones that are the best at it are ones that aren't necessarily worried about the result. They're we're just putting it out there and getting it out there because they have no choice to do what they do. It's a choiceless endeavor. And they're not tailoring it for anyone in particular. And they're just being very honest with what's coming out. And as far as whether it's good, whether it's bad, um, whether a lot of folks like it or a lot of folks don't like it, uh, whether our old fans like it or don't like it, I mean, there's a little bit of that in there, but if I let that take hold, then um, it starts corrupting the actual real process, mm -hmm. and so I just let other people decide. Um, and the real advantage to recording studio records is you're part of that process every step of the way until it's time until it's done mm -hmm. and you listen to it over and over again just make sure technically performance wise sound quality wise it's all there um, my my least favorite listening experience is when we've done any kind of live recording any kind of live records mm -hmm. where I have to go back over a performance and listen to it man I just hate it Mm. I cannot stand it. I would just rather never. If I never had to actually hear us play, I would be so happy. Because um, it's not about the aftermath; it's about the moment. And yeah. then after that, if I when I listen to it, I just hear every single thing that could possibly be wrong with yeah. it. And while being told from a faction of people how much they love it, yeah. and my answer to that is cool. That's for you. Yeah. That's not for me. <laughs> you know, that's not for me, and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know? right Thank on. God you don't hear it how I hear it. And then anyone who <laughs> hears it horribly, I'm like, totally. <laughs> I agree. That's, that was so wrong. It's so out of, out of key or out of pitch or whatever. You know? Yeah. I resonate with our critics a lot more than I necessarily resonate with people that dig it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, a friend of ours, Steph D, from um, the band Purple Dino in Greece, um, where Right now, Stoner Rock is huge, like it's radio play huge. Um, he wanted to know, um, are you at the point yet where you can make a comfortable living all on your music alone, or do you have to supplement your income? And that's, of course, coming from a guy who's yep. you know, got a, a full-time job on the side, like yep. so many musicians. No, I most definitely do not make a comfortable living. Mm -hmm. um, however, I am making a living doing it. Good. Though it's very hand to mouth and mm -hmm. month to month and week to week and and uh, a lot of stress mm. um, that I have to make a lot of conscious effort to kind of compartmentalize my energy 
and when I'm creating, I'm just creating it. I'm not thinking about the job right. aspect of it or the fact that this is where I'm, I'm making my living. And, and to be fair, too, if I was depending on just one particular thing, I wouldn't be able to. Yeah. Um, but it's the combination of being involved with bowl, being involved with solo music, being involved with, with uh, lumbar, being involved with Red Fang, none of which makes a ton of money for me personally, but mm -hmm. all of it together in various little things, doing a couple of shows with Red Fang here, doing a few shows with Bowl there, doing a couple of solo tours here, mm -hmm. uh, getting some lumbar records and being able to sell them to shows there, you know, all these little things equal each month kind of being taken care of but it's not um it's definitely there's nothing that's remotely luxurious about it not even close if you work a full-time uh, minimum wage job you're doing better than i am wow wow so it's really just the the love of music and the fact that you can't not do it right well there's yeah i mean there's that and there's i mean there are times where I feel romantic about it, where I'm like, look, I'm, I'm, I'm totally fucking living it. Yeah. Like, I'm living it. There's, there's nothing at this moment to fall back on. Um, and so there's some romance in that, you know, if, and it's this mega struggle and, and, but a lot of the time <laughs> I, I also feel pretty stressed out about it. Yeah. And, uh, and, I think that what I need to do moment to moment, year to year in our lives, as long as we just kind of trust ourselves, mm -hmm. we figure it out. So how much longer am I going to do this? I don't know. I mean, I'm always going to play music. I know that as yeah. far as being a professional quote unquote musician, mm -hmm. um, that's a story that's continually being written like a journal and the next page is blank. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Marcel van der Haar, who is from the Netherlands, he's a super fan, big vinyl collector. He's excited about you coming to Roadburn this year. Even more excited that I'm selling him my ticket because I can't afford yeah, it's, the it's airfare over there and back, much less living while I'm there. So I'm going to save up for next year. I'm sure. I was just excited to be able to get a ticket when I had the money. Yeah, so I'm like, <laughs> but you know, he's about hours. to get mine and he's excited about you coming. and. He wants to know if you're excited about Roadburn, and from what I've read in the press, you are. Um, what makes this gig special to you? Well, the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly the quality of talent's undeniable. Uh, from band to band to band to band, it's all very carefully chosen, mm -hmm. it's top to bottom. Uh, Walter and Jurgen and uh, um, those guys leave no stone unturned. To, to bring the best that they can to that festival and uh, I think because of the exclusivity ex ex exclusivity mm -hmm. of the festival being that there are so few tickets and so many people that want to go and that it sells out so quickly mm -hmm. uh, everybody that's there I, I just don't ever get any kind of impression that anybody that's at the fest is jaded yeah. or entitled or anything like that it just feels like a lot of very genuine excitement yeah. straight across the board you know we're all like just stoked to be there feeling pretty lucky and privileged and uh, um, so it's it's playing Roadburn in 2010 was a major uh, shift in our life mm. as a band as individuals having that experience really blew us away I mean we'd been selling records over in Europe for a long time mm -hmm. um, but we'd never been there and so finally to go there and meet a ton of people that we did not know that knew us mm. and knew our work and knew every step of what we've done uh, was a major mind job and then there are things that I never thought I would ever see in my life that I got to see at Runburn. You know, I never thought I'd ever have the chance to see The Obsessed. Yeah. Saw him. Never thought I'd see Goat Snake. Saw him. Yeah. You know, there's so many things that happened that were so over the top for me personally. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, it's, and then the flavor of the festival is just, it's personal favorite. Yeah. I can't wait to experience it 
we'll just have to wait another year to yep. see if that happens. Um, two more, and then I'm done with the listener questions, and we can wrap it up. Um, this is a little bit more of an out there question. Hans Vaughn um, says, do you believe in life after death? Um, well, lots of things are alive and lots of things die and life keeps going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so whether there's a particular a particular thing that happens, there's a lot of people that want to tell you that a particular thing happens. Um, there's a lot of a lot of faiths that all agree mm -hmm. that something happens. Um, I consider myself to be a spiritual skeptic, and um, I be I'm I'm a faith-based person in the sense that things carry on. Things do grow, things do evolve, things do change. Um, civilizations come and go, but yet here we continue to be. Mm -hmm. um, we meaning every walk of life, not just the human aspect of it. And so, um, I guess it, 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 for speaking purely for myself, I don't know. I don't know if there is. And, um, and what I'm really interested in for myself is what I find to be true, where I feel like that the dialogue doesn't have to be complicated in just acknowledging that it's true. You know, the beer in front of me, you see that? Yeah. All right, so we agree that that's there. Yeah. That's true. That's We agree it's beer, you know? Mm -hmm. So there doesn't have to be any kind of lengthy discourse around that. Right. And so... Um, so that's kind of where I tend to live, and, and I do believe in a spiritual aspect of things because there's something that enlivens my body that can't be seen, touched, really measured in any particular way. And the difference between me being alive here right now and me being dead here right now is something that you literally cannot see. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so, so, um, so I acknowledge that that's real. Um, however, what particular name it is, what particular faith it comes from, um, what particular destiny it has when it leaves me, mm -hmm. anyone who says that they know that for a fact, I think is really reciting somebody else's words from a previous time. Right, right. Because nobody living actually really knows. Yeah. Only the dead know. Yeah. And they're not here to tell us. Though some people would argue that they are, and I'm open to that too. Mm -hmm. That just hasn't been my experience. Right. So. I can't I can't just sign on if I'm really being like because I want it more than anything I want speaking for my own life and I don't mean this in some egotistical pretentious way I just want it to be authentic yeah and the only way it can be authentic is if whatever I'm speaking is my honest personal experience mm -hmm. then I can have a conversation that I feel like I have footing in and then it's not necessarily anything I have to argue either because I know what I know what I know for myself but um it's a big wide world man just the, the the mystery of it even existing in the first place yeah. is beyond me uh, beyond what this mind can figure out and this mind comes from it yeah not the other way around yeah though some face would say that it is that way that we mm -hmm. create the universe mm -hmm. um, I like all the ideas but there's nothing that's really and it's fun to play around with them but moment to moment day to day what feels good what feels honest yeah. you know I'm much more interested in the truth than I am in comfort yeah yeah Same you know here. I hear you um, so last one this is from Sarah in Jersey City um, she's the admin of a interesting magazine that's focused on Middle Eastern metal um, it's called Jorzine and she says, what's your favorite thing about sharing music with other people? And this may be a little redundant, but I thought it'd be a good one to wrap up with. I like it. I like inclusive ideas. Mm -hmm. Inclusive rather than exclusive. 
I like things that bring people together rather than things that separate them. Um, you know, uh, and I feel like music music is a medium that brings people together in a way that's multi-layered, multifaceted, um, on the surface of which is super enjoyable, being around like-minded community, um, sharing in an experience, um, being able to have a exchange of energy that that feeds in both directions. It's not like we're taking something from the crowd as a performer. To me, I want to give something, and then whatever comes back, then then we're gets re reciprocated and it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and um, you know we're not we're not the band that shows up and it's going to take your at your adoration and take your money and take your your club and its beer and not give something back right. um, we have to give something back and preferably that would be just an amazing night an enjoyable experience mm -hmm. a, a chance for people to to step out of their lives and you know be present in that environment and maybe forget some some nasty bullshit that's happening and, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe enjoy an energy that you know that that each band delivers in their own way that they don't have in their own reality day to day so it's a different flavor it's a different thing that's coming across um, and uh, you know, I, I also want to be able to give availability, you know, where we're not the band that's sitting backstage. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we might do moments of that, but a lot of the time we're out in the crowd, yeah. we are shaking hands, we are meeting people, and we are talking and hanging out, and it's not, um, it's not a us and them. Yeah. It's a all of us scenario, which I think a lot of bands say that a lot more maybe with a little more gracefully by just being it mm -hmm. I almost feel like it's something that doesn't necessarily need to be said mm -hmm. um, but I know that that's something that's important to us so it's the best way to reinforce that community that you're trying to to encourage through the music is really being a part of it as other bands are playing too well and you know the thing is I mean we're all a part of it really yeah I mean there's not one lick of music that's played today that didn't come from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. some other kind of influence. Right. Someone right. who played it before we did, and then we either emulated it or, or tried to do the next version of it or the next evolution mm -hmm. of it or whatever it is. But nothing exists in a vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, cool. Thank you so much for taking this time. Yeah. Uh, thank very, you. very generous of you to spend this much time with me and uh, answering questions from the Doomed and Stone fans and fans of Yob first and foremost. So This is, uh, this is what I really do. appreciate it. Yeah. It's what I do. I'm very fortunate that we were able to make it work given yeah. your schedule and the upcoming interview and everything else. So. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, man, it's, everything's kind of reaching a fevered pitch. Yeah. I mean, three weeks to record. It's a big fucking thing man uh, right now it feels like a lot and that starts you said uh, next February, week. February 21st okay is when we start setting up mics February oh, 22nd yeah is when we start recording and really this record has a lot in common with almost like the catharsis record as far as the way it's paced yeah it's predominantly slower huger arrangements with one crazy faster song where it's actually speed pegs like death metal. Wow. But it's slow. Interesting. But it's super fast and super riffy and, and constantly like you can put blast beats to it very easily. But there's no blast beats. And that's what kind of slows gives it that slow. That, that's what kind of gives it the more churny, yeah, crazy element. But there's uh, but then some of it's very slow. The last song, which is gonna be the major We'll see how what people think, man. I don't know, yeah. uh, but it's very melodic and huge and ball ballady. Um, I'm gonna do my best attempt at like Freddie Mercury, where I'm gonna layer 
at least at least four vocal harmonies, but probably closer to eight or ten. Wow. In all different stages of vocal harmonies, you know, switching into minor thirds and fourths and fifths and upper harmonies and lower harmonies and, and then having a main voice playing off of all the harmonies that are happening and I mean someday we're gonna die and no one's gonna ever see us again and yeah. the record's gonna be there for all time and right. and uh, I've seen lots of footage of Queen where Freddie obviously wasn't doing this twenty part harmonies but no one seemed to mind. So yeah. I'm not trying to compare myself to Frank Mercury, but just that's kind, kind of, of concept, yeah. It's like the it works. Hey. You know, we have the we have that record. Yeah. You know, we get to have those records with those huge epic qualities to yeah. them. So Yeah. It's worth it. That's gonna be awesome. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. I don't know, we're gonna we'll do our best to make it awesome. Absolutely. Right on, right on. Um, do you mind if I take a picture of you? Not at all. Yeah, how are you doing on that? Close. Okay, well we will wrap up and then can we get a